Well, we've been building that on our several weeks now. And I usually start off with a question to those dear folks. In the last couple of weeks, I've started off with the question of, did you have a good lunch? Evidently, they don't, or they don't. Th let me let me back that. Up. They don't think they do. So today, I, I had been thinking about it all week. I started with a different question. I said, "How was breakfast this morning?" <laughs> so, How's y'all's day been? <laughs> We're glad that you're here. We are going to to talk about uh, prayer during this month of March. We are in a a prayer ministry. We'll explain it all in a couple of weeks when we have a meeting and um, explain to you what we're going to do, and hopefully you'll want to participate. And it will be a, a ministry where when we explain it, even our shut-ins can participate if they want to. Uh, we'll just we'll let them know how how and when and what. It's a, it's a ministry that hopefully you'll want to be involved with. But I want us to talk about prayer because when we, you begin to consider prayer, uh, hopefully you consider its power. Hope you, hopefully you consider its effect. Hopefully you consider just exactly what it can do for you and do to you and do for and to other individuals as well. That it is really, if you will, it is one of the, the greatest tools in the toolbox. I think we have a lot of tools. But I think prayer is one of those, that Bible, those are the two best tools that we have. You might have other tools. You might not use them very often. They're still good and they're still lethal. But, but when you look at the Christian toolbox, you say, man, I, I need prayer. I need my prayer. works. Prayer works. We know that James says the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man works. The, word, it, the New King James uses the word avails, but that word simply means it works much works much good. Little boy, nine years old at the time, came in one evening. He said, Hey mom, hey dad. He said, This prayer thing, and you gotta understand this was a little boy who went to church all the time. He's grown now, but but he says, This prayer thing works. And the father kind of laughed and he says, he says, What's going on? And he said, Well, I wanted some Pokemon cards and and y'all told me how to bid on them on eBay, and he said, I won them. He said, this prayer thing works. Well, you know, sometimes we as Christians, we have to be convinced. And we know prayer works. We know that it takes a while sometimes, but we know that it works. This evening, I want us to talk about the idea of knowing what we know with regard to prayer. There's just some, uh, two, three, four simple little things that I want to talk about tonight. We pray. Here's some things that we know. Here, here are the assurances that we have, and thus we know that when we pray, first of all, we know when we pray that the whole Godhead listens. Now that's important, and maybe more important than we realize. We know first of all that the Father to whom we pray, He listens. We pray to God. Jesus taught and. Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, pray after their, this manner, pray you, our Father, which art in heaven. And so we understand that when we pray, we pray to God. We pray to the Father. And so when he asks us for our prayers, such as Jeremiah 33, 3, where he says, call upon me and I will answer, he's giving us the understanding that he is listening. And when we pray, our Father, the Father that we talked about this morning, the Father of creation, the Father of all the earth, has his hands cut behind his ears and he's listening. You know, the psalmist several times asked God, incline unto me. And then God makes the statement. He says, I have inclined myself unto you. The word there means to lean toward. 
And so he says, I am leaning toward you to hear your prayer. What a, what a power to think about the fact that this God that made the world and all things therein, this God that sustains all things, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, by the power of his word, is listening to what we have to say. And so when we, when we pray, we're praying to God who listens because we're praying to him. But then we understand that when we pray, we pray to the Son who listens because we pray through him. He's the one. He, the, as John would write in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, he's our advocate. He's the one that pleads our case. He's the one that Timothy called in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, we have one mediator, Christ Jesus. He's the one that when we pray, we pray through him. I'll get to that one in a minute. But we pray with regard to, with, we pray, or excuse me, to Jesus. We pray through him. That's why we end our prayers. You know, so many times you say, why do we end our prayers in Jesus? Well, he reminds us. He reminds us to pray through Jesus. Let Jesus take that as our mediator and mediate to God. Let him take it as our advocate and plead our case for us. Let him be the one that takes it to God. And so we pray through him. And so we end our prayers in the name of Jesus or, or your son or in Jesus name and so Jesus listens then when we pray the whole Godhead is the Holy Spirit he with us when we have which are difficult to be uttered in Romans the 8th chapter he's able to if you will put them in words which we need we need help sometimes. You know, sometimes, have you ever got to the point in your life where you're going to pray and you know what's going on in your life and you know the seriousness of what's going on in your life and you think, okay, here's what I really need to pray on, but you just can't find the words. Or you get to the point where you know, I just, I, all I can do is just, Lord, you know, help. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does. When when we reach that point in which there are words that are hard to be when we get to the point where we just don't know what to say, but we know what's going on, the Holy Spirit helps us. And so Paul would say in Romans 8, 26, the Spirit helps us in our infirmities. He helps us in our difficulties. He helps us in our terrible times of kneeling before the very throne of God and not knowing what to do, what to say, or how to say it. I like what one preacher said one time, because admittedly when you mention the Holy Spirit, we all throw up our hands and say we just don't know. But he said, here's the best explanation of Romans 8.26, and it's the best I've ever heard this far. It's the idea of waking up a bed. If you've got a bed and you got to say maybe especially say, queen size or a king size, that you either of you need to wake up or to keep walking around it several times to get everything straight. And this preacher like in Romans 8, 26, it's like the fact that you side of the sheet and you pull it up the other side and he pulls it up. And then you pull the cover up and he's on the other side pulling the cover up. And then you pull the spread up and he's on the other side pulling the spread up. That he's helping you in your prayers. See, when we pray, we know the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are listening to our prayers. We don't have to, to, to doubt that. We don't have to guess. We know. But secondly, we know that when we pray, we tap into the very power of God. God is powerful. We know who God is the fact that he created us. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11, Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments. There's a in there. 
the Lord just doesn't list, here's commandment number one, here's commandment number two, here's commandment number three. Now, he gets on down the list, and he does. But he reminds us that there's only be one God in our life. He tells us how powerful he is. For in six days, he created the Lord created. Here's the power. The power of God is seen in the fact that he spoke this world and he spoke all things into existence. And so God was in the beginning. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me tell you a little bit about the marvel of creation in which you are. In Psalm 139, the psalmist makes the statement. Marvelous words. In other words, you're... Tremendous. I did a little research. I did a little research. And so I'm going to read a couple of notes. Don't do a lot of things, a lot of reading when I preach, but, but I'm going to get the numbers right. I did a little research. And I found out th- this week that the average human being has 37 trillion cells in the human body. And in those 37 trillion cells, there's 20,500 genes in each cell. Now, something can go wrong in those genes. You can have a little mutation, a little malformity, if you will, and something is not exactly right. But nevertheless, think about within the cell, you have 37 trillion cells in your body, you have 20,500 genes in one cell that we can only see with a microscope. The gene itself is made up of 23 chromosomes. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And when you think about that, as I was thinking about that and thinking about the power of God, I was thinking about how most of us are considered normal, if you will. No no defects of any large proportion. And yet, God put all of that, packed all of that into our bodies and made us such that everything works together. That's power. That's the power that we tap into when, when we pray. We, we tap into a God that has power enough, to, but also power enough to sustain us. In Daniel chapter 5, 23, Daniel reminds the, the Israelites there, reminds those to whom he's talking. He says that within the hand of God is the very breath that you have. Within the hand of God is your very life. God has our life in His His magnificent power. He's able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we think or ask. That's His power. That's His might. To be able to not just make this world, but to keep it going. For nothing is impossible with God, Jesus said. For with a God, all things are possible. Now think about, if you will, the power of God in the life of the people of the Bible. Think about Daniel and the lions. Think about how prayer delivered him, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how prayer delivered them. Think about Gideon. And leading the children of Israel and being delivered. Think about Jonah. And think about the power of God providing, as the book of Jonah says, providing this great fish, but then also delivering Jonah from this great fish. Think about Paul. You know, we just got through studying Acts. And we, uh, last week we talked about how that Paul was, was in Rome. 
and how that Paul eventually ended up in Rome, although he was a prisoner, although he was shipwrecked, he was bitten by a snake, and, and, and folks, <laughs> some folks didn't receive him, and he ended up in Rome just like God had told him. To think about the power of God to protect him, to get him to that point. Think about Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Barren, not with child, but prays to God and then receives a child. Think about Esther and her prayer and her role, if you will, in, in delivering the children of Israel. Think about Peter being bound in jail in Acts 12, being delivered as the church was there in prayer for him. But we can go on. But we see the power of God. We see the might of God. That when life seemed to be throwing at these folks some of the, the greatest curveballs that they could face, when life seemed to be throwing at them the greatest obstacles, the greatest speed bumps. And you know, it's interesting because I do a little driving through the streets just sometimes just to kind of familiarize myself with the area and all. And our city fathers have put speed bumps in on some of these streets to keep people from flying up and down them, and that's fine. But, you know, some of them are like climbing mountains. They're just, you know, they're, and then you go, you, when you start up them, you look at the sky. When you start down them, you think, oh, me, I hope I get there. That's what our fathers, our city fathers have done. Well, life's like that. Sometimes we're going up and all we're doing is looking up. And sometimes we're going down and all we're doing is looking down and we're hoping to hit the top, hit the bottom. These folks were going through that. And the prayer in their lives. Now, now think about it. And you go through the Bible and you look at these folks. Sometimes it took a while. Sometimes their, their prayers were offered and they knew the power of God. They knew the might of God. They knew the ability of God. But it's still, because it wasn't the time, it wasn't the right time and the right events going on, but in the fullness of time, the right time, God did what he did, needed to do what he needed to do, and took care of it. God is a great God. And we need to understand that when we pray, that power that created us, that power that sustains us, that power that delivered these folks can do the same for us. We need to remember <laughs> the story. The story is told of a lady that was riding on a train. And as she got onto the train, she was clutching to her breast. She was clutching a bag. She was holding it tight. And when she sat down, she continued to clutch the bag. The train rolled on for quite a while, and she was still clutching this bag. And finally, the individual that was sitting beside her said, Ma'am, said you can lay that bag down, and you can let that train, let this train that we're on carry that bag for you. You don't have to carry it all the way by yourself. So many times in life, we're trying to carry things through life by ourselves. And we need to let the train carry it for us. We need to let God carry it for us. And so we're reminded of the fact that when we pray, we're really tapping into that power. And so we say, well, you know, I don't know if God will, will hear me on this. I don't know if God will take care. Let's let God worry about that. I don't know if God can. Let's let God worry about that. I don't know if God will. Let's let God worry about that. Let's just take it to him and, and say, God, here's what I need. You do what's best, and I know you will. But you take care of me. I'm reminded of my sweet mom. Every once in a while, mother, after dad died, mother would, uh, she was in assisted living. Mother would have a, a conversation with me as a preacher, not as her son. Because mother, uh, she was not raised in the church. She was raised in the denominational world. But 
she became a member later on in life. And one night in her little room, we had a conversation. And it was kind of some rough days for her, and she was going through a difficult time and a lot of questions, things that she wanted to answer and I tried to answer them for her. And she said, you know, she said, I just got to the long time. I couldn't stop myself. Hallelujah. And she said, I don't just you know what I need. You take care of it. And she said, when I said it, I went off to sleep. I said, yeah, but it didn't work. <laughs> well, I, I got there. <laughs> I understand. But we need to remember that there's that power that God brings that peace because he has that power. Jesus can say, as he did, if you believe in me, anything you ask, you'll receive it. There's that power. But then thirdly, I want you to know that when you pray, there's the providence of God that's affected. There's the providence of God. What is the word providence? What does it mean? The word providence is not found in your Bible, by the way. You can look in concordance. It's not found. It may be found in some of these that are are uh, more paraphrase type than than translations. <clears throat> But the word, para, uh, word providence, <clears throat> excuse me, just simply means the idea of foresight, to look ahead, to look ahead. We define it from a Christian perspective. We define it on that wonderful passage in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We see the example of it in the story of Joseph that we're studying on Sunday morning. How that Joseph, we studied this morning the prayer that, or excuse me, the dream that he saw that he told his brothers about that ultimately they they would be, you know, falling in line and he would be the, the ruler and later, well, sure enough, you know, he saves his family because he's able to interpret Pharaoh's dream and, and he's able to to provide them from the standpoint of storage. He, he's sort of the one that, that, well, he's not sort of the one, he is the one that heads up the, the, the saving of the grain for the years of their prosperity. And then when it comes the drought and when it comes the famine, that when his family comes, his brothers come, making a long story short, uh, he's able to save them. And you say, well, there's the, there's the providence of God. You look in the book of Esther, you not only don't find the word providence, you don't find the word God, but you, you see the providence of God as she takes care of her own children, her own family and her own lineage, takes care of Israel. She was a very vital role, very vital lady in the history of Israel. But it has to, to do with the providence of God. The providence of God is the working out of life's events for our good. Now, there's a lot about the providence of God that we don't understand. There's a lot about the providence of God that not only we do not understand, but it is hard to accept. It's hard to accept how that the providence of God sometimes takes time, years, literally, in our life. We don't understand that. Sometimes we don't understand how God does it, how God takes all the little things in our life and God works them so that we learn from them, we grow from them, but yet at the same time it's for our good and it all works out. I don't know how a zipper works. I know it has a pull tab. You know, you pull a thing, that little mechanism, it comes up and the zipper goes together. You pull it down and the zipper goes apart. I don't know how it works. I've looked at zippers. I've tried to figure that thing out. I've torn one or two up in my younger years. I still haven't figured it out. Of course, I'm not the smartest person in the world. I admit to that. 
but I just know that it works. I don't have to know all the the if you go if you will the ins and the outs, the little idiosyncrasies, the little parts, the little working parts of the promise of God to know that it works. I see it in the life of Joseph. I see it in the life of Esther. I, I believe that, that I find it in my life as well. But when I go to God in prayer, I know that God, being my Father, takes care of His children, takes care of His creation. And so when I go to Him and I ask Him for the things that I need, He being the Father that, that's willing to take care of the children, He's willing to send the rain on the just and the unjust. He's willing to take care of all of us. He was willing, if you will, to take care of Esther. He was willing to take care of Joseph. He's willing to take care of us. His providence. His providence is such that it touches our lives. And while, as we said, we may not understand, faith says you don't have to figure it out. You just have to accept it. You don't have to figure out how it works. You just have to accept it. It's like a zip. You don't have to figure it out. You just understand that it works. And when it quits working, when it breaks, you know, you, you get fixed somehow. God's, if you will, providence, his zipper for our life it doesn't break. God takes care of it. And so we're reminded of a great little Psalm. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask Brother Jim if he will. It's Psalm one. It's Song 191 in the book. God will take care of you by Sevilla Martin. Uh, it's a beautiful little song. Brother Jim, if you don't mind, if you'll lead that for us, that will remind us of the point we're trying to make. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. So we know that when we pray, we know that the Godhead listens. We know that we tap into a tremendous power source in our prayers. We know that in our prayers, He will work His providence out for our good. But then fourthly, <coughs> we have security. And we need to know that we have security in our prayers. And that is that you can call upon me and I'll answer. That's a great assurance. To think that we can ask and it will be given to us, seek and we'll find, knock and it will be open to us. There is admittedly in that, when we look at it, there is admittedly a, a statement that seems to be in contrast to that. And it's the fact that sometimes God says no. The fact that God sometimes says no when we pray is best seen in the example of Jesus. When Jesus asked to be spared from the cross, he said, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. 
But notice his attitude. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see, his attitude was, it's not just about me. It's what's best. And when we pray, we have to understand that we're praying to a God that's going to answer. He may sometimes say, yes. I'm problem. We're going we're gonna to give you what you need. We're, we're going to give you exactly what you've asked for. Hezekiah was told by God, get your affairs in order because you're going to die. And Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall and prayed to God. And God spared his life for 15 more years. Go back to the, to the point we made a while ago of Acts chapter 12 where the early church was praying for the release of Peter. And it happened. God says yes. But there are times in which God says no. It doesn't mean that he's not listening. And it doesn't mean that he's not answering. It just simply means that sometimes that no is best for us. We may be the best parent, grandparents in the world. And we may give our children, our grandchildren, everything that we can possibly give them. But there are times that they're going to ask for things, and we're going to tell them no. You know, I, I think Suzanne would give Graceland anything, but if, if Graceland comes up and asks for a pony, she better tell her no. Because Ethan, Ethan <laughs> we'll never see him again. There are times when I ask for things in my life, and God says no. That's not what you need. And I may ask for a long time because I may think, oh, that is what I need. And then I may have to basically throw up my hands and say, well, I either didn't need it or God's not listening. Well, maybe it's the fact I didn't need it. Nevertheless, not my will. But yours be done. We have the security of knowing and the security of uh, in our prayers is is that God will answer our prayers. Sometimes, though, he substitutes. You ever put uh, sweetener in your coffee or in your tea instead of sugar? It's not the same. I'll tell you it's not. I use sweetener instead of sugar in my coffee. It's not the same. It gives it a little sweet taste from time to time. Kind of knocks off the edge at times. Sometimes I like to drink it black, but sometimes I like to put a little sweetener in it. Don't put sugar. It's not a health thing. It's just a personal choice that I made a few years ago. I saved five calories somewhere along the line. God sometimes says you need to substitute. There's a great example of that, isn't it? 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, where Paul said that he asked three times that his sword and flesh might be removed from him. Do you remember what the Lord said? The Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Notice then the attitude of Paul. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the cause of Christ might be glorified. The attitude for all of us is... Is Lord, I'm praying. I know, number one, that you've heard me. I know, number two, that you have the power to do anything. I know, number three, that you'll always work it out for good. So, number four, my security is knowing that you've heard me. You're going to answer me. It's going to be the best for me. And I'm going to learn to like it. Whatever it is. And so we have then the admonition. Keep praying. Keep praying. Paul would say to pray without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Jesus would say men should always pray. Our admonition is keep praying. It's our lifeline. It's our lifeblood, but it's our lifeline to God. It is an article that was written in the Gospel Advocate in the middle 70s by Brother Eklon Gardner, who 
at that time was I don't well yeah he was he was president of Free Harmon University College at the time. But uh, the the article on the front of the Gospel Advocate was prayer God's or man's golden link to God, and it is. It's our opportunity to take what's going on in our life that's both good and bad, both positive and negative, what's wonderful and what what is is fantastic, but also what's hurtful and harmful. It's also our time to communicate with God and tell him how, how thankful we are for him and how wonderful we believe that he is. It's our time to take the cares and the concerns of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ it's our time, it's our opportunity to take the world's events. It's our time to take our needs to God. Now, we always have to remember that it always has to be couched in the simple admonition of your will be done. So this evening, if you're not a New Testament child of God, or you're an individual that needs to rededicate your life, our prayer is that you'll come. All together we stand and sing.